Well, good morning once again. Happy Sabbath. I'm kind of curious, just out of a, a show of hands, I've mentioned this a few times before uh, through announcements and, and it's come up at Vespers and things like that. How many of you are familiar, of course, with this series right here? <laughs> Few are. Now, I am kind of curious. How many of you have already seen the first video uh, that was released here for season one? That's episodes one, two, and three. A few of you have. A few of you have. Now, th this is the one that was in theaters for like two weeks. You didn't know that, right? Did you not understand what happened? So they've hit season four now. And they decided, because it's a great way to do a little bit of extra fundraising, to produce these in a way that they are movie theater friendly. So a couple of weeks ago, they released season four as episode one. Or it was basically, it was is movie one. And it was episodes one, two, and three. And they were in theaters for two weeks. And at about Valentine's Day, they changed what was in theaters. So if you look at the signs, it still says The Chosen is in theaters, but it's a completely different movie is currently in theaters. They currently have episodes four and five in theaters. Starting this upcoming week, they're going to switch over to do six, episodes six, seven, and eight, which will run for the final two weeks of the stretch. And going into uh, the month of March, they will finish their run and then will eventually announce when they're going to put it on their app, probably about Easter time. Okay, so I'm aware of where you guys stand when it comes to The Chosen. You've done them for Vespers. Some of you have done it for, for personal worship. I have to admit, my first exposure to them was back in Michigan when this whole, like, global pandemic thing happened. And we ended up using it as a great uh, discussion starter for our Sabbath schools. Uh, our youth Sabbath school in, in particular watched The Chosen and then we would come together and on Zoom discuss what happened that week. We did discover something very quickly, though, because The Chosen wasn't nearly as well known as it is now. When we told the kids to watch The Chosen, do you know how many of our youth went back and watched the play from the International Camp Re a couple of years ago, which was also called The Chosen? So the kids come back, and, and I'm starting to ask them questions about the bot, and they're like, what does this have to do with the life of David? So one of the conversations that came up when it comes to The Chosen is obviously it does its best to be biblically based, but it is far from perfect, right? One of the big conversation starters we had to have with it from the beginning was the fact that it does a remarkable job at filling in the blanks. I was amazed to think that there was so much material in the Bible, and yet there were so many episodes and so many little narratives that aren't directly taken from the Bible. We have this tendency to want to fill in the blanks and this desire to, to tell the rest of the story. And, and I have to admit, they've done a pretty decent job of telling the story. And without getting into too many spoilers, I have to admit that one of the most interesting things about season four, that first episode or that first thing that came out, is just how impactful a certain scene involving a certain character was given that neither of them are actually in the Bible. But the people have become so invested in these stories that the stories themselves are taking on a, a level of, of passion that have people now perhaps more interested in the book, or more interested in the movie than in the book. And I have to admit, that's one thing I'm a little concerned about. But it's not just the chosen that has a tendency to do this. You know that, right? We love to fill in the blanks. We love to make the stories more interesting. And this is not a new phenomenon. Going back centuries, there were books that were written, I would call them fan fictions, based on the Bible, that would tell the stories behind the stories or between the stories. You would find stories that were written about boy Jesus. Not child Jesus, not baby Jesus, but what happened in that in-between from that time where he was a, a wee child and visited by the, the wise men 
to the one time we know when he was 12 years old and he went to the temple, to all of a sudden now he's, in, he's almost 30, and now he's starting his ministry. What happened in that gap? And we started to fill in the blanks, and you run across these apocryphal writings known as things like the Gospel of Thomas or the Apocalypse of Peter, which talk about things like Jesus being the worst kid to play tag with because they would try to tag him and he would just run on top of the water. The one time that his dad was just desperately trying to get a job done in his carpenter shop as he made a bed and realized that he decided to measure once and cut once instead of measure twice, cut once, you know this, he measured once. And when he cut the boards for his bed, the boards were too short. Jesus, being Jesus, stretched the lumber stretched the wood so they would be made to spec. They filled in the gaps with all sorts of stories, and it's something that we've done ever since. Admittedly, in the Adventist church, we're guilty of this too. While I was working in the library this week, I, I happened to notice that we had this big, beautiful book called Joseph. Anybody familiar with the story of Joseph? Joseph. Some of you may not know this particular book, but you may know the series of books that were written by Terry Five Ash. Terry Five Ash was an employee of Andrews University, worked in the history department, and wrote these books uh, to kind of tell the stories behind the stories, included all sorts of interesting cultural backgrounds and all sorts of interesting details. I have to admit, I've never read Joseph. Anybody ever read Joseph? The only one of her books I've ever read is actually... Ruth. Anybody familiar with the story of Ruth? You may not have read the book, but you've read the Bible. You know the, the book, right? Well, what was interesting to me is I started to read through this story, and I read across story after story and all of these interesting things, and, and, and the book itself is a short book. It's only about 140, 100, no, it's, it's 180 pages long. And I'm reading about all of these amazing characters, so many characters, in fact, Almost 120 characters, if I remember correctly. There are so many characters, there had to be a glossary of them in the back of the book. You don't remember who this guy is? You flip to the back of the book. Oh, he runs the shop. Oh, his brother is the dry cleaner. He's not the dry cleaner, but it's that kind of thing. And I realized that I'm reading story after story, and this, I'm just getting so engrossed in, in the story of Ruth that by the time I hit page 130, all of a sudden, it clicked with me. Wait a second. This right here, this is Ruth chapter 1. She had done 130 pages in, out of, in a book of 180 pages of backstory. Setting a narrative with dozens and dozens of characters, so many so that I couldn't keep track of them, in a story that in the Bible only has seven named characters. And I realized that there was just something going on where all of a sudden the Bible isn't interesting enough. And we have to fluff it up a little bit. And so that's one of the things that I'm concerned about. Because if the Bible stories aren't interesting enough, you need to read, a, you need to read them again. Because as we've spent the last two weeks dealing with this guy here, haven't there been some interesting stories here? And some of the stories have just been interesting stories of that they're not crazy. He's not, he's not walking on water. He's not stretching lumber. He fed lunch to a couple of guys who came to dine with him last week, it's based in Genesis 18. But that story was remarkable. So we spent a couple of weeks dealing with this guy and some of the stories. But admittedly, there were some that I've still skipped over. The reason I skipped over many of those stories is because there's another part of this that we need to talk about. There is another named character who plays a central role in many of the stories involving him because they also involve her. We need to talk for a moment about Sarah. I feel like a series of the major characters of the book of Genesis would not do justice to the overall story if we only focused on the men. The women played a tremendous role in many of these stories. Dare I say, 
These stories would have gone differently or perhaps never happened at all if it wasn't for the women who press these, these narratives forward. If I were to ask you, what do you know about Sarah? Some of you may know, besides the fact that she's married to Abraham, well, thanks to our scripture reading, you know one thing about her, that she is the one who laughed at God. But the more I read through the stories of Sarah and the roles that she played in some of these, these passages, the more I realized something important. When we talk about Sarah, Sarah much like Abraham, is a complicated figure. We spent two weeks to discover that Abraham was not perfect, right? Sarah is a complicated figure as well. But the more I learned about her, the more I realized that the God that she worships is not. Sarah is complicated. God isn't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to open your word, Lord, I pray that as we get into these stories where we try to, try to figure out what's going on, what's happening behind the scenes, Lord, I pray that our imaginations wouldn't get us off course where we try to fill in the blanks and lose sight of why we're even studying these stories in the first place. Lord, as we study Sarah, help us to not study Sarah. Help us to learn more about you. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we we get to see what you did and how people responded to what you did and how you did it and when you did it and just how you are. I pray that we would learn how we should respond as well. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's talk for just a minute about Sarah. Make sure we're on the same page about the biblical character of Sarah. When it comes to Sarah, like I said, she is a complicated figure. Uh, she is one of the smallest major characters in the Bible. And I'm not talking about stature. I'm talking about, we know that inherently Sarah is a significant figure in the Bible, right? The wife of Abraham is a significant figure, but the way that she's significant actually kind of shocked me because she is mentioned in five other books of the Bible. The book of Isaiah, and four of the epistles in the New Testament. That makes her the most frequently referenced woman of the Old Testament. No other woman is referenced outside of her story more than Sarah is, with five references. Okay? So she is a significant figure, but very small at the same time, with a whopping five references. Another noteworthy fact about her is that she is the only woman whose age at death was noted. No other woman do we know how old she is when, we, when she died. Do you guys know how old Sarah was when she died? <laughs> You're not telling? Yeah. Okay. I understand. You shouldn't ask a woman how old she is, but she's kind of dead. <laughs> I don't think she'll mind, especially because Moses spilled the beans and said that she was 127 years old when she died. 127 years old. And interestingly enough, she is one of only two named women in the Hall of Faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. If you're looking for this great hall of faith, these tremendous characters and, and people who change the world, like the, the, the Noahs and the Abrahams and some of the ones that I have and will preach about, you've noticed I've, I've referenced Hebrews 11. She is one of only two named, named women in that group. Do you know who the other one is? Man, Bible trivia is all over the place today, isn't it? It's Rahab. Rahab. So that puts Sarah in really interesting company, doesn't it? So let's talk a little bit more about Sarah, because we know she's inherently a big deal, but we just don't know a lot about her. And so as I was doing my preparations for this message on Sarah, as I'm reading through commentaries and, and all of these other books about her, one of the things I discovered is that we love to fill in the blanks in her story. There's one commentary that, for example, has a significant section. It was approximately five paragraphs explaining 
what they admit is a speculation, they can pinpoint the exact moment that Sarah started her menstrual cycle. Yeah, woe is right. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. There are all sorts of interesting speculations about what she did and why she did it, why things happened to her, and what she did in response to it. And admittedly, when I'm reading back through the Bible, none of these things are actually mentioned in the Bible. We love to fill in the blanks with Sarah because she is a major character, but not major enough to have a lot of writings about her. And in the roles that she plays, in the times that she shows up, what's interesting is half of the stories of Sarah aren't actually about Sarah. She plays what I would consider a passive role in comparison to an active role. What's the difference between active and passive? It's doing something, you're doing something to something else is, is the active, something else is doing something to you is the passive. So one of the ways that I've, I've heard it described is uh, uh, basically, are you the actor or are you the object? And in half of Sarah's stories, she's the object. She's not the actor. Dare I say, Sarah is a character, but about half the time, she's more prop than character, which leads to increasingly speculative thoughts and fancies about what, what Sarah's life is like. Go, for example, to Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, when we see the calling of Abraham, and Abraham is told to go become this great man of faith, one of the next stories that we find is the story of Abraham as he travels forth he ventures off into, let me get it here, Genesis chapter 12. My Bible keeps flipping from, there we go. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 10. The very first thing that Abraham has to do is Abraham has to head from the land of Canaan and head down to Egypt. And while he's there, they meet a man. Who is this man? Who? It was Pharaoh. It was the, the, the king of the region. Uh, he, he is... It's a significant player. And we know one thing about Sarah, for sure. She is beautiful. Beautiful at 65 years old. Beautiful enough that Pharaoh said, I see you. <laughs> he ends up taking Sarah into his household. And they have this, this story that goes into very little detail. And then they realize that something bad happened here. And there's all sorts of conversations and, and, and all of this, but basically what it comes down to is she ended up in Pharaoh's court. Why? Because Abraham, I, the word is lied, but what he told was a half-truth. What's the difference between a half-truth and a, and, and a lie? Thank you. Thank you. Nothing. Is it technically true that they were related? Is that the whole truth? And is that half-truth enough lie that someone's going to get in trouble for it? If anybody's ever had a teenager and you wanted to know what happened to the car, there are enough half-truths to go around that are not the whole truth, and it really changes how you respond to the story, isn't it? There was a big difference between that one time I knocked the mirror off my car hitting the side of the house versus the one time that the, the mirror just happened to fall off. I don't, uh, my mom tried to change the mirror, and all of a sudden the glass fell out. It's the strangest thing. And so now we get into all of these, like I said, these speculations. And at one point, one of my commentaries was at least honest enough to say, we can sit here and try to paint whatever picture we want with the limited information we have. Moses, when he wrote to his audience, understood, but we are now 3,500 years later, and we don't. We can try to make Abraham seem like he was doing a wise thing by trying to protect himself from a Pharaoh who had seen Abraham as an opponent rather than somebody worth negotiating with.
other commentaries, they admit, would go through and see Abraham as a scoundrel, sneaking and lying and deceiving Pharaoh in a way that when God himself gets involved in the story and sends plagues upon Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 17, whose fault is it? Abraham's fault. Is he smart or is he a scoundrel? The commentary admits we don't know and anything else is speculation. But you know what's interesting is you know who we're not talking about right now in this story about Sarah? Sarah. We're talking about what Abraham did. We're talking about what Pharaoh did. You know who doesn't say a word and doing any of the talking in the story? Sarah. Not a word. She's along for the ride. She is a prop. It's interesting. She, in fact, disappears from the scene in chapters 13, 14, and 15. Does not show back up again until chapter 16. And when she shows up in 16, she takes an active role. Instead of being a prop, She's finally a character. And oh boy, is she active. Genesis chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. I don't know if you knew this or not. I mean, it had only been mentioned in four verses previous to this point. But Sarah had not been able to bear children to him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant, she said. Perhaps I can have a child through her. Now this leads to all sorts of other commentary conversations. And admittedly, once again, my commentaries finally at one point had to put their foot down and say, we don't know if this was a good thing or a bad thing. We do know it was a common thing in that day. And we know how it turns out. The answer is not very good. So Sarah was the one who brought up this proposal, and Abraham agreed with Sarah's proposal. So Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. And like I said, we don't know exactly, was this, was this a good thing or was this a bad thing? All we know for sure is how it turned out. It was a bad thing. And wouldn't you know that as soon as things go bad, verse 5, and Sarah said to Abram, this is all your fault. <laughs> this is all your fault. Where does this actually sound a little bit familiar? Ah, she caught it. Garden of Eden. The woman all of a sudden has this idea that is impressed upon her based on some other reasoning. She logics it out proposes it to the one who is with her, in fact, puts it into her husband's hands. He says, you know what, this is fine, let's go with it. And as soon as things go south, all of a sudden we're playing the blame game once again. Man, it sounds like the Garden of Eden all over again. And I'm sure this isn't the last time that this happens either. Where a husband and a wife have a miscommunication and all of a sudden it's everybody else's fault. I will just add a little side note here. I am not a professional counselor like my, my, my previous predecessor, or is predecessor the word? Yes. No. Yeah, predecessor is, yeah, uh, successor is the, the next person who, who may come along. And if I keep preaching sermons like this, you'll get to meet them soon enough too. <laughs> My predecessor was a professional counselor, but I'm not. But I can at least give you this much of a two cents. In this story, in Adam and Eve's story, and in countless other stories, there are problems that arise. And often they involve marital relationships where a husband and a wife find themselves dealing with a problem. Notice how I said dealing with a problem rather than the, uh, the other person is the problem. One of the things that I have had to wrestle through with myself is to realize that my partner is not my enemy. There are problems that are out there, and I am not Andrea's problem. Andrea is not my problem. And so I shouldn't treat these bad circumstances like they are the problem when sometimes there are problems that happen to us that are neither of our control. 
the blame game gets out of control very quickly. Now, admittedly, there are problems that are totally the other person's fault. When Sarah says flat out, I have an idea, here's my idea, have fun with the idea. Eh, we need to talk about your ideas here. But unfortunately, we have this tendency when there are problems that happen that we make the other person the problem, right? There are little problems that are out there. And we need to remember, with as much grace as we can, especially because we're still feeling the high from Valentine's Day, that person is somebody that we love and loves us. And as long as they're doing things with good intentions and to the best of their ability, let's just do what we can to try to think to ourselves, okay, how can we work together to solve this problem? Now, sometimes that means stepping up and saying, we have a problem here. I checked our bank account, and it is zero. And I can't help but notice that one of us is spending a lot more than the other one is. What can we do together to not spend so much? Right? That's an easy way to partner together without blaming the other person. Now, Sarah dragging Hagar into Abram's bed, that is a different conversation. Anyway, you get the point here that Sarah is a very complex figure. Sarah instigated chapter 16 and then immediately has made it all out to be Abraham's fault. And now you feel bad for Sarah for something that she started. More stories of Sarah as we continue to read through Sarah. In chapter 17, once again, plays a passive role. Sarah is not present in chapter 17, at least not significantly, but in chapter 17 is where she makes the jump from being Sarai to Sarah. Her name gets changed and she's not even in the room when it happens. Chapter 18, she once again becomes active. And this is where we actually had a chance to read the story last week. You remember the story, Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 1, the Lord appeared again to Abram near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting by the entrance of his tent during the hottest part of the day, and, and he looked up and he saw three men standing by, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them, and he welcomed them, and he bowed low to the ground. And we went through the story last week. Who are these men? At least one of them. God. He has a chance to have a meal with God. He has a chance to interact with God. And, and they end up having quite the conversation at the end of this chapter. But there's something that we... We need to go back over real quick. When he says, hey, I want you to stay, I want you to have a meal, he runs to Sarah and he says, hurry, grab three large measures of your best flowers, how my translation puts it. We lose the, the, the connection here, but it's approximately five, or it's approximately 20 liters of flour. That is five gallons of flour. This is enough to make 60 loaves of bread. Get to work, little woman. Pat, pat, pat. And she didn't even have a KitchenAid to do it. She was the KitchenAid. Anyway, I want you to go and make some bread. And so she goes and she makes this bread. They prepare the feast. And one, finally, once the feast is served, something is interesting about what happens here. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 9, the food is served, and they kind of said, hey, where is Sarah, your wife, the visitors asked. And one of the commentaries noted that apparently this is unusual because they would have expected Sarah to be here. Where is she? And Abraham says, she's inside the tent. This, by the way, is where one of my commentaries with his like five paragraph justification thinks that she's in the tent because at this point she started her menstrual cycle, which is, yeah, how do you even come up with that one? Anyway, um, yeah. Um, so when they said, where is Sarah, your wife? It leads to an interesting thing where she's inside the tent, right? Obviously. Have you ever been in a different room, but all of a sudden you may not be there physically, but you all of a sudden become there audibly? Your mind goes there and all it took was to hear your name. Have you ever been part of a conversation and you didn't even know you were part of that conversation, but you heard your name? 
something known as the cocktail effect. It's the ability for two people to have a conversation at a cocktail party, and all of a sudden they said, uh, as they're talking, that they say Aaron, and all of a sudden Aaron's like, wait, what, what, what about me? <laughs> so they drag Sarah into this conversation, though Sarah is not present in this conversation. And you'll see how this plays out because now that we've got Sarah's attention, we can resume our conversation. I mean, it's not really about Sarah, but it's totally about Sarah because one of them said, I will return to you at about this time next year and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, of course, Sarah's listening to this conversation from the tent because of course she is. When you say your name, the first time it caught her attention. When you said she's going to have a son, I bet you that really caught her attention. And so Abraham, in case you didn't know, are very old at this time, and Sarah is past the age of having children. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Sarah can't have kids. This is only the sixth time that has been mentioned about Sarah thus far in her story. And so she laughs silently to herself. She says, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is so old? She kind of has this moment by herself and says... It's a really cute promise, but how could it be? I love this. It didn't hit me until I hit it again this morning. And then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Now pause for a second. Go back to verse 12. Did she laugh out loud? No. Was she present in the space? So couldn't see her face, couldn't see that reaction. He couldn't see her, he couldn't hear her, and yet God turns to Abraham and says, why did she laugh? There are three people in the, involved in this conversation, and two of them know that Sarah laughed, and God asked the one who didn't know. You ever feel like that, like an outsider, like you're missing something in a conversation here? There is an inside joke, and I am not inside right now. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Who's he asking that question to? Oh, you caught it pretty good. Because it's tempting to say he is literally talking to Abraham. He is subconsciously or subtextually talking to the lady in the tent. But in the greater scheme of things, who is he asking that question to? To all of us. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid. She denied it. From the tent, you can almost hear her yelling out, I didn't laugh. And now God, who's still talking to Abraham, turns and says, yeah, you did. And that is where the story ends. We then turn on to deal with the whole thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, and if, the, if there are 50, and if there are 45, and, and that whole conversation. We don't see Sarah show up again until chapter 20. This is where we leave it. And what's interesting to me is I realized that as tempting as it is to make Sarah's story about Sarah and getting to know her better, if it was about Sarah, you would think that they would have done a better job of making her look better when the story was over. But it's about God. The story ends when it's clear that God has the last word because the story is about Him. And what do we learn about this story? Well, we've said it before, we're saying it again. God always keeps His promises. We said it before, two weeks ago, when dealing with the fact that God always keeps his promises when it comes to giving Abraham the son that he's promised him for four different appearances. God always keeps his promises. And so the question I struggle with is, why do we laugh at God? Why do we laugh at God? God has said it. It's going to happen. We may not understand how it's going to happen, but when God promises us something, when God calls us to do something, why do we kind of say, yeah, right, God? Oh, you don't know what I'm talking about. 
You don't know what I'm talking about. When, when you read that Bible verse, it talks about how God will help you overcome your addictions. And you kind of chuckle and say, that's a cute promise. But don't you know? When God promises to be the one who will bring you comfort in your pain, and you kind of chuckle to yourself and said, that's a cute bumper sticker. But do you know what I'm going through? Why do we laugh at God when we read these promises? Why don't we take God more seriously? That's what laughing at him is. is we're not, there, there's just something in us that rejects what he is saying because it doesn't seem serious. Why do we laugh at God? Is his word not enough? Remember, we're in the book of Genesis. His word brought this universe into existence. You think it can't also help you overcome that battle because he told you it would? One of the things we need to know for sure is that God always keeps his promises. But, so we're clear when it comes to that, it doesn't always mean he's going to keep his promises in our way. There's a story that I use, I don't have time to go into it right now, but when it comes to the story of, of how to best understand uh, God keeping his promises, it has to do with another way out there passage uh, in the book of Second Chronicles. We're not dealing with Sarah anymore. In fact, we're going to deal with the story of Amaziah. And this one's only going to take a, about a 90-second detour. There was once a king named Amaziah, spoken of in 2 Chronicles 25. And Amaziah decides he's going to go to war one day. He, he feels this. He, he, he just has to go fight. And so he goes out and he, he brings around 300,000 troops, and he realizes that 300,000 troops is not enough. 400,000 sounds a whole lot better. So he decides to hire 100,000 soldiers from Israel because he's the king of Judah, and Israel and Judah aren't together, but that's a different sermon. He hires them for about 7,500 pounds of silver. That's In the Bible times, it's known as 100 talents of silver. He hires 100,000 fighting men from Israel, and he decides, I'm going to go to war. But just before he can get to war, God sends a prophet to him. And he says, you know what? Good luck. You want to go to war? You want to have a fight? That's fine. Go have a fight. But I'll tell you right now, don't take those men. Those men are not with God. There is a reason that Israel and Judah aren't together right now. It's because Israel and God aren't together right now. So you have to make a choice right now. You can go to war and you can take 100,000 soldiers. Or you can take one God. Which would you rather have? And Amaziah agrees. He says, yeah, you're right. I'd love to take one God. But my, my minor business thing, the, the question here, um, is there a return policy? Can I get a refund? Do you guys chuckle? I'm not kidding. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about all the silver that I paid to hire the army of Israel? Can I get my money back? And the man of God replied, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. So what do you think happens? He sends those soldiers home, he goes to war, and he wins. Now, admittedly, what happens next is really sad, because those 100,000 men were really fired up. They were ready to go to war, and then they said, hey, if we can't fight them, then we'll fight you. And they got into a fight, next thing you know, everyone's fighting, and, and then, oh yeah, by the way, Amaziah dies. Uh, and then in chapter 26, Amaziah's son, Uzziah, takes over, and he lives, and he's and then he dies. And then in chapter 27, his son takes over, Jotham. And once again, he's generally a pretty good guy, but he has to go to war too. And at one point when he's fighting his fight, in 2 Chronicles 27 and verse 5, notice this. Jotham went to war against the Ammonites, and he conquered them. And over the next three years, he received from them an annual tribute of 7,500 pounds of silver and 50,000 bushels of wheat and 50,000 bushels of barley. Did you notice it? She noticed it. Did you notice it? How much did he get? He got his 7,500 pounds of silver. Not 6,000 pounds. It wasn't gold. It wasn't bronze. Not 10,000. It was 7,500 pounds of silver, 100 talents of silver. Exactly what had been paid before. Now all of a sudden, it's shown back up. 
I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's God paying his debt. Because God promised I can give you that exact same amount back. I can make it up with you, right? Oh, wait, no, that's not what he said, is it? He said, I'm able to give you much more than that. So while we're at it, I'm dumping in bushels of wheat and bushels of barley, and you'll get it for the next three years. Because God always pays his debts, and God always keeps his promises. But here's the thing that we need to realize from those stories. Did he pay his debt in Amaziah's time? Nope, didn't pay his debt in Amaziah's time. Did he pay his debt in Uzziah's time? Nope, didn't pay his debt in Uzziah's time. Did he pay his debt in his finally in the grandson's time? Yeah. But God paid his debt. Not in my time, but in his time. And I'll tell you, when he says much more than that, my imagination would have gone to, I don't know, like cattle. Can I get some, can I, can I get some uh, uh, a gold to go with this? No, no. I want you to have wheat and barley. I know that you've been having a problem with food recently. I take care of your food too. God always keeps his promises. This is what he taught the, the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah. That's what he taught Sarah. And that's what he's teaching us. He always keeps his promises, even when we don't. When you go through Sarah's stories and you see that she plays active roles and passive roles and she's involved and she fails and she's, she's okay, but man, some of the things she's doing are not that good She has these ups and these downs. The story isn't about helping us to understand Sarah better. God is using Sarah to help us understand God better. And so by the time, you'll notice that there's another failing with another king, not Pharaoh this time, but Abimelech in chapter 20. Finally, after this whole up and down, Abraham prays to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants so that they could have children. And wouldn't you know that Abraham is praying that This enemy, this dude who just took his wife, that he can have kids. What kind of prayer is that? I can't have them, but maybe he can. Wow, what a lesson to learn. Because, by the way, the Lord calls all the women to be infertile because of what happened with Abraham's wife, Sarah. The Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. And the Lord gives again. And you know what's interesting is the very next words out of Moses' pen. Because Moses didn't include chapter breaks. Moses didn't include verse breaks when he wrote this story down. The next word out of Moses' pen as he wrote this story down, Genesis chapter 21, starting in verse 1, the Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. Because God always keeps his promises. And what happened? Chapter 21, she gives birth to Isaac. And why did she name him Isaac, by the way? Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter, (laughs) and all who hear about this will laugh with me. Because boy, was that a funny story when you think about all they went through. You know that whole saying of, you'll laugh about this someday? That's the story of Sarah's life. She did some things that weren't funny, though. You know what's interesting? You know, I said that she was one of only two women mentioned in the Hall of Faith. Do you know what her recorded statement is in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11? It is by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, even though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. She believed that God would keep his promise. Now, what's interesting to me is when I look at the record, it doesn't sound like it, does it? Because when God gave his promise, how did she respond? She laughed at God. I know it's tempting to look at the moment and say that our stories, just like Sarah's, are complicated. But that's the great thing about grace. Is that when heaven's eyes looked back on Sarah's journey, they didn't hear the laughter. They saw the faith. You may be a complicated figure, but you know who isn't? God. And we know exactly what we need to know about this God after these stories. We don't have enough information to get to know Sarah that well, but we do have enough information to get to know God better. And what do we know about that God? 
<laughs> he is the God who always keeps his promises, the one who can open wombs, the one who provides, the one who calls, the one who, I could just keep going on and on and on and on. I, I, I do like the way that we could make it nice and simple and just say, you want to know what God is? He's pretty great. Erin's kind of smiling because she's like, oh, that sounds like the praise team introduction for our closing song today. Our closing song is How Great Thou Art, hymn number 86. I invite you to stand and sing with me today, How Great Thou Art.